Hi, good morning, guys. So I'm Dr. Greenberg, Karen. And usually when I come and present these lectures to you guys, I like to make it interactive. But we're going to go with a little different formal format today for Dr. Scally's grant. And I got the lucky topic of infections in the elderly, which is a huge topic. I've been working on it for a couple weeks. And when we were finished with it, it was actually so big that we decided, rather than try to cut it down, that we made it into two parts. So today we're going to kind of do some introduction stuff. We're going to focus on pneumonia and urinary tract infection today. And then when I come back in a couple weeks, we'll do some other and talk about some other common infections. I always kind of like doing these lectures because I actually learn a lot when I put them together for you guys. And I'm actually going to point out some things, how it's actually changed my practice. I've been out for three and a half years now. And I kind of, you kind of get into your groove as an attending, what you like and what you don't like. And um, we're going to talk specifically about one thing in particular from doing this lecture that's changed for me. Um, basically, we just want to say that this is part of the um, Camper Geriatric Grant, which is care of the aging medical patient in the emergency room. And this is a grant through the Reynolds Foundation. So what are we going to try to accomplish today? Basically, we're going to recognize and treat infections. And we want to see that in the elderly patient how challenging this can be because the symptoms are quite subtle and atypical. And I think that that's something that we're really going to drive home. It's going to be repetitive throughout the lecture how subtle and atypical these presentations are. So what we want to come away from, we want to recognize those common atypical presentations of the various geriatric infections. We're going to learn how to institute treatment in the elderly with respect to medication dosing and drug interactions. We're going to try to identify admission criteria and appropriate transitioning of care from the emergency department. So what I want to do is we're going to do three questions right up front. And right now, you guys can log in with your answers, and we'll see where you are across the board. But I'm actually not going to give you the answers right now. They're going to pop up again throughout the presentation. So we're going to keep you in suspense. These are actually real cases that I had in the ER while putting together this lecture to try to make it realistic. So first, we have an 82-year-old male comes in from home with his wife. He's complaining of shaking chills and a fever of 101 prior to arrival. He just finished a 10-day course of penicillin yesterday for a salivary gland infection. In the emergency department, his only complaint is left flank pain. So which of the following does not place the patient at increased risk for infection? What do you guys think? A would be a history of sarcoid and taking prednisone. B, a history of urostomy bag for 11 years. C, daily exercise. D, decreased cough reflex. And E, malnutrition. OK, so we're going to lock you guys in here. And we'll see uh, what people think. Oh, we have one outlier. Who said D? No, just kidding. <laughs> OK, so let's go on here. And we're going to come back to these. Um, second patient that I had, 91-year-old female from a nursing home with change in mental status. We see this every day. Vital signs, temperature 101.8, blood pressure 77 over 40, heart rate 85, respiratory rate 16, pulse ox 92% on room air. The patient's niece is at the bedside, says the patient has not been eating well, non-productive cough, and a Foley catheter in place for two months, secondary to a history of urinary retention. Which of the following organisms is the least likely cause of infection in this patient? So you've got A, Enterococcus UTI, B, Enterovirus, C, Staph aureus pneumonia, D, Strep pneumomeningitis, or E, MRSA cellulitis. All right, so we'll lock you guys in, and let's see what you guys think. All right, so majority think B. Well, we have a couple outliers here. I guess second place right now would be E. OK, so one more. 
71-year-old male presents with confusion for the past two hours. Patient's wife says he was complaining of chest pain at home and she called 911. Vital signs, blood pressure 220 over 110, heart rate 120, temperature 99.6, respiratory rate 16, pulse ox 93% on room air. Of the following lab tests, which is associated with a greater mortality rate during hospitalization? Okay, so let's see what we got here. Okay, so most people think E, and then we've got a couple people went with A and C. Okay, interesting. Good. All right, so here we go. Some introduction about why this is such an important topic for us as emergency medicine residents. By 2020, so we're nine years away, patients aged 65 years old and older will constitute 16% of our population. Already, they account for over 15 million emergency department visits each year. And a large percentage of these visits are related to infection. Fever is present in 10% of all elderly emergency department patients. They also account for 65% of patients with sepsis. There is significantly greater mortality risk for any given infection compared to younger adults. So I think that mostly we know that because they have compromised immune systems compared to younger, healthier populations. But we're just going to try to drive these points home, why it's so important. Elderly patients have three times the mortality from pneumonia and five to ten times the mortality from urinary tract infections when you're talking about younger adults. And again, part one is going to talk mostly about pneumonia and UTI because those are the two most common that we see. These statistics make appropriate evaluation and treatment of infected elderly an essential skill for us because you don't want to miss it. Clinical presentation of infection in the elderly is often atypical, subtle, and elusive. And again, we're going to drive that point home repeatedly throughout the lecture. You want to make, therefore, it's important to make an early diagnosis and then initiating treatment is challenging. Elderly may not only have fewer symptoms, but might present with nonspecific consequences of infection that on the surface appear unrelated. And we're going to talk about some examples of that. We all know about the people that come in with a fall or they're not eating. The worst is around the holidays, Thanksgiving. They haven't seen grandma in six months and all of a sudden they're bringing them to your ER because they're just not acting right. One of my favorite complaints around the holidays. <laughs> So some nonspecific symptoms, generalized malaise, falls, changes in mental status or cognitive impairment, anorexia. I always seem like the falls seem to come in in the middle of the night too. And you think it's going to be an easy case coming from new seasons, fall out of bed. And then when your nurses go in and take vital signs, their temperature is 102. And now you, instead of just the cat skin of the head for falling out of bed, you're doing a full workup on these patients. Classical manifestation of infection, fever, and leukocytosis is maybe absent or blunted in 20 to 30 percent of serious elderly infections. So that's a big deal. You don't want to let those things lead you down another path just because they're afeb afebrile or have a normal white blood cell count. In contrast to the young, where fever is commonly attributed to a viral process, in the elderly it's associated with severe bacterial infections. So you never really want to chalk these patients up to viral infections until you're sure that you've ruled out bacterial illness. We'll talk about that a little bit more. It's important to note that criteria for fevers in the elderly are unique compared to other patient populations and include elevations in body temperature from baseline of 1.1 degrees Celsius or greater. Now we kind of always learn about that throughout medical school and residency. Tough in the emergency department, right? You're never really going to know what somebody's baseline temperature is. And it's always kind of annoying when patients tell you their temperature in the ER is, you know, 98.9. And they say, well, I always run at 96. Okay, <laughs> but in this specific population, if they do know that in the elderly, it always seems like it's the young patients that say that, but in the elderly, you might want to give it a little bit more credit.
Furthermore, the opposite end of the spectrum, hypothermia, decrease in body temperature, is not an uncommon presentation of an underlying serious infection. Okay, so let's talk about some risk factors. As we age, it's associated with numerous chronic illnesses and comorbid conditions. And we all know that from looking at their transfer sheets from the palace, and they're on 20 different medications for all of their different diseases. It's also associated with polypharmacy, that list of 20 medications, as well as immunosuppressive medications. A lot of these patients are on prednisone, anti-rheumatoid medicines, you can also see aging associated with changes in the immune system, and this includes a reduction of T lymphocyte function and cell-mediated immunity. So therefore, they're at increased risk for fighting off these infections. There's an impairment of normal physiologic reserves. Some things that you'll see in the elderly is a decreased cough reflex, which leads to aspiration pneumonia, a very common complaint that we see. Impaired arterial and venous circulation, which compromises wound healing, can cause skin infections like cellulitis. Compromised wound healing, so therefore the cellulitis is a common infection in them and a more concerning one because of the impaired circulation that you see. Living environments, such as assisted living facilities and nursing homes, allow for the development of infection and foster the transmission of infectious agents. And as we go through the talk, we're going to talk about the difference, why it's so important if you're taking care of patients from home versus an assisted living or nursing home population. It's going to be a pretty significant distinction between those two populations as well. So when you take care of these assisted living nursing home patients, they have a rise and um, exposure of antibiotic resistant bacteria such as MRSA, the methicillin, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and VRE, um, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. The elderly have more invasive devices such as indwelling urinary catheters, we all know about that one, intravenous catheters, PICC lines, perm caths, feeding tubes, and tracheostomies, all of these are more common in the elderly population. These devices compromise host defenses, enabling bacteria to enter the body and cause infection. Malnutrition, which is common in the nursing home population, is associated with a limited immune response and impaired wound healing. And we all see all these little Geriatric patients, men and women, sometimes, you know, it's really depressing for us in the ER. It seems like they're wasting away because of this malnutrition. Polypharmacy is also frequently observed and can contribute to infection in itself. Okay, so we're going to go back to question one. This was the patient from home, the fever, the flank pain, even though he just finished a 10-day course of penicillin. And we wanted to talk about which of the following does not place the patient at increased risk for infection. So I want you guys to go ahead and um, log in one more time, and then we'll go over it. All right, so let's see what we got this time. Oh, good, 100% say C. And that is the correct answer. Okay, we talked about, obviously, the history of sarcoid and taking prednisone, prednisone being an immunosuppressant. Obviously, that's going to increase your risk of infection. This patient actually did have a history of urostomy bag for a history of bladder cancer. So any type of indwelling device, it's not a Foley catheter, but it's still a urostomy bag, which increases your risk of infection. Daily exercise is the correct answer. So daily exercise would not place you at increased risk of infection. Of course, decreased cough reflex is going to predispose you to pneumonia, respiratory infection, and malnutrition we just talked about as well being a big contributor to your risk of infection. Good job. So let's talk about fever and infection now and why when these elderly patients present with fever, you're not going to send them home. Elevated temperature is one of the most common complaints in the elderly and is present in approximately 10% of elderly ED visits. A lot of patients with an overwhelming infection will actually present afebrile. So when you're 
so to speak, lucky enough that your patient presents with the fever, you know right away what path you're going down. When fever is present, it is infectious in etiology approximately 90% of the time. So don't think right away, thyroid storm, malignancy, rheumatoid disease. You know, when they say, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, don't think zebras, think infection right away. And then you can kind of consider those other things aside. Fever in elderly emergency department patients is most commonly bacterial in origin. And in several studies, it has been due to a viral cause in less than 5% of cases. So of course, influenza is going to play a part falling under a viral illness. We'll actually talk about influenza in part two. But for the most part, you want to think bacteria, not viral. A temperature greater than 37.8 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit is associated with markers of serious illness in over 75% of the time. And these are the statistics to support that. So if you have a fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to see positive blood cultures, death within one month, need for surgery or an invasive procedure, hospitalization for four or more days, administration of IV antibiotics for three or more days, and possibly a repeat ED visit within 72 hours. Your workup should include CBC with differential, urinalysis, chest radiograph, blood cultures, urine cultures, and a lactate. These are just some things to get you started. Obviously, you're going to be doing chemistries, maybe cardiac enzymes. These are just basic things that you definitely want to include. And we're going to take a minute and we're going to talk about lactate. And this is in particular the one thing that I'm talking about that has changed my practice since putting together this lecture. It's so bad to the point where the nurses are actually saying to me, what is going on with you ordering all of these lactate levels? Because <laughs> I'm ordering it on almost every geriatric patient right now. It's really changed my practice. I'm usually a CRP girl. I love my C-reactive proteins. It's kind of my sick or not sick test. And I'm still ordering my CRPs, but lactate's moving right up there. And this is why. In patients with infections, an increasing serum lactate value of greater than 2 was literally associated with a relative risk of mortality during hospitalization at 30 days and at 60 days when compared to patients with a serum lactate level of less than 2. There's a greater magnitude of association with mortality than either of the two other commonly ordered lab tests, a leukocyte count or a serum creatinine. So elevated WBC count might be 20,000, but if you have an elevated lactate level, that's actually going to is a higher prediction of your mortality. Higher ED lactate values are associated with greater mortality in a broad cohort of admitted patients over age 65 years. And this is what's really interesting, regardless of the presence or absence of infection. So that means maybe that elderly patient who comes in with a fall and you run a lactate level on them and it's over two, their mortality is higher than the elderly patient who falls with a normal lactate. So it actually goes both ways. You definitely want to consider it in your patients with infection, but it's just kind of a marker for your geriatric patients in general. And uh, I found this fascinating. And um, the uh, case that's coming up, we'll talk about because that was a real case. So going back to fever and infection, getting away from lactate a little, a little, maybe you guys will consider it and start ordering some lactate levels in the ED and see what you come up with. You also want to consider the possibility of other potentially serious causes of fever which are present 10% of the time. I mentioned these just a little bit. You can have rheumatologic disease, thyroid storm, and environmental exposure heat stroke, heat related illness, medication related events, and malignancy can present with fever as well. Although fever often signifies the presence of serious illness in elderly patients, severe infection may also be present in the absence of fever. 
And that's our challenge and what we're trying to work through today. The failure to mount a febrile response to infection has been particularly noted in nursing home patients. Sometimes these are the patients that you just don't have a good feeling about. They're afebrile, their WBC count is normal, maybe their pressure's a little borderline. These are the patients that you probably want to admit them. Make sure that their blood cultures, urine cultures are negative before you discharge them back just because they're coming from a nursing home facility and they're going to have nurses taking care of them. You want to think twice. The most accurate definition of fever in the elderly may be a change in temperature from the patient's baseline. Elderly patients with a temperature of 99 degrees Fahrenheit or higher or with an increase of 2 degrees Fahrenheit from baseline should be considered to be febrile. Again, that's a challenge for us in the ER. A lot of times you call the nursing home and you're lucky if you can even talk to the nurse that was taking care of the patient that day. <laughs> so just again, have a high degree of, a, of suspicion in these patients and a low threshold to admit. All right, so we're actually gonna have question two and three come up back to back right now. So this was the 91 year old from the nursing home, change in mental status, febrile, low blood pressure, septic. Couple triggers here, non-productive cough, Foley catheter. Which of the following organisms is the least likely cause of infection in this patient? Ah, interesting. So most people, 91% of you guys said B, okay. Um, some people still signing in with pneumonia or meningitis. The take home point from this question was don't think viral. Always think bacterial first. Only 5% of the time is it gonna be a viral illness. So that's why um, the least likely cause would be enterovirus. That's the only virus that's up there. Enterococcus, Staph aureus, Strep pneumo, MRSA are all serious bacterial illnesses. Good? Okay. All right. And this was the 71 year old. Elevated blood pressure, elevated heart rate, pulse ox 93%. So, of the following lab tests, which is associated with a greater mortality? I have a feeling you guys are all going to get this since I drove it home. <laughs> Good job. Lactate level. This was real. This uh, gentleman's lactate was 3.6. This gentleman actually presented um, with DTs. Um, we did everything on him, blood cultures, urine cultures. I actually even spinal tapped him because he was so confused, even though I thought the money was on DTs. But it's really interesting. So again, even though he didn't turn out to have an infection, with a lactate level of 3.6, his mortality is through the roof compared to a patient with a normal lactate level. So that was actually a really interesting case. OK, moving on, bacteremia. The presence of bacteremia in elderly patients with infection signifies a more severe disease state and greater risk of mortality. Bloodstream infection is among the top 10 causes of death in elderly patients in the US. This is a tough one for us because you're not gonna make a diagnosis of bacteremia in the emergency department. You just kind of have to be suspicious. There's no blood culture result that's going to come back. The only time that you're ever going to know that a patient is bacteremic is the blood culture that comes back positive on your shift and now you're calling that patient back to the ER stat for more treatment. Risk factors, increasing age, comorbid diseases, the big ones, which almost every elderly patient is going to have at least one of these, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, neuropsychiatric disease, malignancy, and stroke. If you guys take care of an elderly patient that doesn't have at least one of these, it's going to be rare. Recent invasive procedure or instrumentation, especially talking about GU or GI procedures, and presence of indwelling catheters.
interesting here, elderly patients with diabetes have twice the rate of bacteremia as those without. So another red flag you're going to look for are these geriatric patients with a history of diabetes. You're going to have more of a threshold to admit and observe those patients. Although fever is generally considered one of the cardinal signs of infection, numerous studies have demonstrated that an elevated temperature is often not present in elderly patients with bloodstream infection. Scary. Okay, so again, here come these repeat themes. Just because your patient's afebrile doesn't mean that you're off the hook. You have to still go down the road. As a result, absence of fever cannot be taken as proof of the absence of bacteremia in this patient population. The only independent predictors of bacteremia, altered mental status, we see that all the time, vomiting, and white blood cell band forms greater than 6%. So a couple things on this slide that are important. Altered mental status, fine. We know that that's a common presentation of infection in the elderly. Vomiting. I remember one of my teachers when I was at residency, Dr. Di Leonardo over at Cherry Hill, she always told me that vomiting in the elderly is bad. And it's something that I've always remembered when patients come to the ER with vomiting. So I'm always doing more of a workup on them, including blood cultures, maybe a CAT scan of the head, because they ha maybe it's a bleed in the head, maybe a CAT scan of the abdomen, looking for an occult infection there. You don't want to blow off elderly with vomiting. Something bad is usually the cause. And then talking about bands, make sure that you look at your differential. I think a lot of times we look at the initial CBC that comes back and the diff doesn't come back right away. And maybe their white blood cell count is normal or just slightly elevated and you're kind of on the fence. And then the bands come back and it's 10 or 12. Never, ever, ever send a patient home with bandemia, even if it's slightly elevated. Admit them, wait for their cultures to come back, and cover them. Nobody will ever fault you for admitting a patient to the hospital with bandemia. So make sure that you're being cognizant and looking for that differential to come back. Elderly patients are likely to present with nonspecific signs and symptoms. Among the most common presenting symptoms of bacteremia, again, altered mental status, confusion, going hands in hands. We talked about weakness, we talked about falls, and decreases in functional status. And again, that decrease in functional status is the complaint you get around the holidays when the family comes and says, all of a sudden my mom can't go to the bathroom on her own or can't prepare meals. Just have your radar up for those complaints. Laboratory testing fails to provide diagnostic certainty. And again, we know that because we're talking about bacteremia specifically here. And again, that's why our jobs are challenging and people depend on us. Among the elderly with bacteremia, 20 to 45% will have a normal white blood cell count. That's a big number. You're talking about potentially 45% half of your patients with a normal white blood cell count. Relying on an increase in the erythrocyte sedimentation rate is also insensitive for the diagnosis of bacteremia in the elderly. I don't really do sed rates. I like the C-reactive protein, um, but again, they're just saying that it's insensitive as well. So if it's normal, you still have to consider it. Kind of scary, actually. The etiology of bacteremia is heavily influenced by patient-specific factors. So the patient that does present with a fever, if you're lucky enough, if they have an indwelling line, you're going to think about the skin source. If they have an indwelling catheter, you're going to obviously think urinary source. If they're coming in with an altered mental status or an impaired gag reflex, you're going to think pulmonary source, pneumonia, respiratory. Urinary tract sources are the most common overall, even in the absence of indwelling urinary devices. And I think we know that. We'll talk more about this with the UTI specifically. It's kind of the hardest test to get from these guys. It's always the money test and the hardest one to get. So recently, I've actually been putting, you know, may in and out straight cath. We don't really, we've been getting away from putting the Foley catheters in permanent, 
well, temporarily, I guess, for their admission in the emergency room. So it's something that you want to try to jump on early. If you're lucky, the patient can ambulate to the bathroom, but most likely that's not going to be the case. Urinary tract account for 25 to 55% of bacteremia in elderly patients. So that's usually the money test. Lower respiratory infection, 10 to 34% of the time. Unknown source, 11 to 31%. That's great, right? Unknown. Intra-abdominal source, 9 to 20%. Again, vomiting is bad. Look for intra-abdominal if it's not something obvious. Skin or catheter-related source, 9% of the time. And that's kind of an interesting point, too. A lot of times when it's not pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, then you think, shoot, what is it now? Make sure that you look at their skin. Um, when's the last time you yourself rolled over an elderly patient? It's difficult. We need to be looking at their sacrum, especially looking for pressure ulcers, sores, sources of skin infection cellulitis. Gram-negative or organisms are the cause 70% of the time. That's usually coming from your UTI, E. coli. Gram-positive organisms, 25% of cases, usually strep pneumo from pneumonia. Anaerobes are less than 10% of cases. Polymicrobial infection, 5 to 17% of the time. This slide is important because it tailors your antibiotics choices. You need to make sure that you're going to have a good drug that's going to cover your gram-negative organisms and your gram-positive organisms. You're going to consider anaerobes, but it's going to be lower on your list. So E. coli is the most commonly isolated organism. Other gram-negative organisms that we see are Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. So again, when you're thinking of your antibiotic choices, you have to keep these things in mind. Certain drugs aren't going to cover particularly Pseudomonas, and we're going to talk about that as we move on. Your gram-positive organisms, Strep pneumo, Staph aureus. Enterococcus is becoming more common and strep viridans. So you want to keep these slides in mind as we keep going. The likelihood of staph aureus bacteremia is increased in residents of long-term care facilities, particularly residents with nursing home associated pneumonia or skin and soft tissue infections. Staph aureus bacteremia will make you extremely sick. It's less common in patients dwelling in the community. So again, that's always why we're making that distinction. Are they from home or are they from a facility? Bacteremia in the elderly is associated with high mortality rates. Overall rates have been 20 to 37% in most studies. That's high. I mean, we're talking about mortality rates. That means of all these elderly patients that come through the emergency department, one in five die. That's sad. Um, I know at Cherry Hill, you guys see a really high elderly population. At Marlton, we see a very high elderly population. Most people get admitted that we see there. And it's kind of a scary statistic to think that one in five patients, I'll take care of 10 geriatric patients in a shift at Marlton. Big numbers, important. All right, so let's specifically um, talk about pneumonia now. So here in the United States, pneumonia and influenza rank sixth among the leading causes of death. With advanced age, rates of morbidity and mortality from pneumonia increase dramatically. Nearly half of all cases of pneumonia involve patients greater than 65 years of age. Among nursing home residents, pneumonia is the second most common cause of infection. UTI is one, pneumonia is two. And it's also the second most common cause of bacteremia in a nursing home. Several factors contributed to this, because when you associate it with the aging process of the respiratory tract and lung tissue, that predispose older people to respiratory infections. Changes in the mucociliary transport system associated with age and smoking have a negative effect with clearing of bacterial pathogens. Now, most patients from the nursing home aren't actively smoking anymore. But of course, it's a history that you want to elicit because it's going to predispose them to pneumonia. 
Changes in lung capacity, elasticity, and compliance are common with age. Most cases are, in fact, related to microaspiration of bacterial pathogens colonizing the oropharynx. They also have ineffective clearing. So therefore, ineffective clearing of mucus and secretions from the respiratory tract make patients more susceptible to an aspiration pneumonia. Talking about microbiology, and again, why it's important, because it's going to tailor our antibiotic choice from the emergency department. Strep pneumonia, big one, most common isolate from a sputum culture. So it's 20 to 30 percent of community-acquired pneumonia cases in the elderly. It's also the most common pathogen found in nursing home residents. So you have a case of pneumonia in your ER, you're going to think coverage for strep pneumo right off the bat. There's also homophilus influenza. It can either be encapsulated type B or the unencapsulated strains. These patients usually have chronic lung disease. They're usually male and they usually present with a productive cough. Legionella. This is actually um, something that a lot of the admitting attendants ask us about in the ER and something that they'll usually order as a test on the floor. These infections tend to occur sporadically, but you still want to think about it. They usually appear in the summer and the fall, and they may be found in water condensed um, from air conditioning systems. So we always think Legionella water. Mycoplasma pneumonia. It's a common atypical pathogen causing pneumonia in patients under the age of 60. But elderly patients actually have a somewhat lower proportion of cases of atypical infections compared to younger, healthier patients. So this is going to be lower on your list. 60 and above, we're not going to really think mycoplasma. We're going to think strep pneumo, homophilus, legionella, and staph aureus more commonly associated with nosocomial infection, so something that you pick up in the hospital or the nursing home. This causes a multi-lober infiltration, so when you look at your chest x-ray and there's multiple areas of pneumonia, it should set off some thoughts of Staph aureus. Staph aureus is also frequently associated with bacteremia. And a well-known manifestation of Staph aureus infection is the florid onset of pneumonia following recovery from influenza. So that's usually a board question, actually, and we'll talk about this more in part two in a couple weeks. Post-influenza pneumonia, Staph aureus. So you guys will get that question right in two weeks. Gram-negative bacilli, rare in younger patients, but more likely to affect nursing home residents compared with community dwellers. Nearly 12% of pneumonias in patients from nursing homes. So gram-negative infections, nursing home, elderly, rarely seen in younger patients. Again, classically, cough, especially productive cough and fever, are the hallmarks of respiratory tract infections. Other clinical manifestations can include pleurisy and rigors, but in our elderly patients, so the clinical presentation might be similar. However, the rates of patients presenting with these manifestations change. Although nearly 60% of patients with community-acquired pneumonia presented with cough, only 34% of nursing home patients were noted to have a cough in the setting of pneumonia. Confounding the picture is the fact that only 60 to 75 percent of nursing, pa nursing home patients are febrile on presentation. So we're driving home the points that they present atypically. Initial workup when you're looking for respiratory infections, pulse ox, chest x-ray, CBC with the diff, blood cultures, and serum electrolytes with the BUN. Again, initial things, you're going to add more testing. Make sure you include these. Chest x-ray remains the gold standard for diagnosis of pneumonia. Serum chemistries really have little impact on a patient outcome, but you need it for calculation of creatinine clearance because that's going to influence your choice and dose of antibiotic therapy. Do you guys remember how to calculate a creatinine clearance? We have med students here. 
somebody. <laughs> That's the Osmoles. Osmo holiday. But good job. That that was right for that. Yeah. We got it? Uh-huh. Times seventy two. And if they're female? Times point eight five. Okay. So 140 minus age times their weight divided by 72 times their creatinine and if they're female times 0.85. Now at Virtua it's done for me <laughs> and I think at Kennedy it's done for us too in this day and age. But at Virtua I actually write admission orders. So it is actually something that I look at on a daily basis because things like Zosin and Vanco and Levaquin even, we use Levaquin at Virtua, they have to be renally, um, renally dosed and renally adjusted. So it's something to keep in mind as you're going through. Okay, so let's specifically talk about community acquired pneumonia in the elderly. The etiology is similar to that in younger patients. Strep pneumonia is still the most common etiologic agent and it accounts for approximately 50% of your cases. Haemophilus and Moraxella are also relatively common. So community acquired pneumonia, the, like that first case of the patient who was from home, Strep pneumo, Haemophilus, Moraxella. Again, because it's going to tailor your antibiotic therapy. Atypical agents such as chlamydia pneumonia, mycoplasm, and legionella are seen approximately 15% of the time in community dwelling elderly persons, which is a must, much lesser percentage than in younger patients. Enteric gram-negative rods and staph aureus are also rarer pathogens and are more likely to be seen in the most severely ill patients. Community acquired pneumonia developing after viral influenza has an increased chance of being cause of Staph aureus. So again, there's that point again. So let's make the differentiation between community and now nursing home and other healthcare associated pneumonias. I think we're getting pretty good at this because it's in the literature frequently now and we do know to tailor our choices differently. But let's talk about the definitions and how you determine it. So nursing home pneumonia is clinically distinct from community pneumonia in the elderly. It's associated with increased comorbidity, poor functional status, and greater mortality. The mortality rate is 19 to 53 percent as compared with 8 to 14 percent in community pneumonia. Those are kind of big ranges, but just so you get the idea, it's at least two to three times increased mortality rate. Definition of healthcare acquired pneumonia. So, hospital acquired pneumonia, pneumonia that's not present at admission that develops 48 hours or more after hospitalization. Then you have ventilator associated pneumonia, which is pneumonia that occurs 48 to 72 hours after endotracheal intubation. This is the big one the healthcare associated pneumonia, and that means pneumonia occurring in the presence of any of these following situations. Residents in a nursing home or long-term care facility is going to be an obvious one. Receipt of intravenous antibiotics, chemotherapy, or wound care within the preceding 30 days. So this slide's important because these are actually people from the community that come to the ER. So you, unless you elicit this history, you're not going to classify them correctly. All right, lots of people in the elderly are on chemotherapy, radiation, and we're seeing a lot of wound care. I have a lot of patients coming through Marlton who are be treating like hyperbaric treatments at the wound care centers. That's becoming much more popular. Hospitalization in an acute care setting for two or more days in the preceding 90 days. Again, if you don't ask that question, you're not going to be able to make the classification and move them up to this higher level of healthcare associated pneumonia. And attendance at a hemodialysis clinic, all of your dialysis patients automatically meet the definition of healthcare associated pneumonia.
So strep pneumo is still the most common organism. However, enteric gram-negative rods, anaerobes, and staph aureus are much more common in these patients as well. So we're really going to have to broaden our coverage now. Pseudomonas rates have been 4 to 25 percent, but as high as 52 percent. Haemophilus, Moraxella, and Chlamydia pneumonia are atypical agents, and they're much rarer in the healthcare-associated pneumonia population than the community-dwelling population. So now you're starting to add coverage for the gram-negatives, Pseudomonas. So talking about treatment, going back to treatment now that we've made the distinction to community-acquired pneumonia. They should receive a second-generation cephalosporin plus a macrolide or a non-pseudomonal cephalosporin plus a macrolide. And I think that's what most of us are doing. Most of us are doing Rocef and Zithromax for these patients that are getting admitted to the hospital. So non-pseudomonal cephalosporin, Rocefin, macrolide, Zithromax. Or monotherapy with the fluoroquinolone. I know over at Virtua, we use Levaquin. But I think at Kennedy, you guys use Avalox, right? Well, you guys, we have Levaquin at Kennedy now. Okay. Um, dose for Levaquin for pneumonia? 750, right? Not 500? Okay. Talking about treatment for your nursing home health care associated pneumonia. Patients from nursing care facilities require appropriate antibiotic regimens to adequately cover multi-drug resistant organisms. Ideally, your antibiotic choice will include two drugs for gram-negative coverage as well as a drug for MRSA. This has changed my treatment a little bit as well. Usually I just do two drug therapy. This is actually talking about doing three drug therapy from the ER to appropriately cover these patients. So your first gram-negative drug should be an anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin like cefepime or ceftazidime. I think that we use um, cefepime. An anti-pseudomonal carbapenem, imipenem or meropenem. Or an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam inhibitor like peptazo, which is zosin. Okay, so keep in mind this slide, and this is drug number one, talking about anti-pseudomonal coverage. Your second gram-negative drug should actually be an aminoglycoside, like gentamicin, or an anti-pseudomonal fluoroquinolone, like Cipro or Levaquin. This also gets hard with patients' allergies. A lot of times you're probably going to end up doing something like an aminoglycoside, but for me it's a little scary to use those in the elderly population because they're highly nephrotoxic. So you want to make sure that you're getting weights and dosing it appropriately. And then if MRSA is a concern, you're going to do Vanco or Zyvox is also recommended. So usually I'll do Zosin Vanco or Cefepime Vanco, of course if they're not penicillin allergic, which seems to be most people these days. But they're actually talking about these nursing home um, pneumonias is that you want to be adding a third drug like Levaquin or Gentamicin. So it's interesting. It's really um, the patients and the admitting physicians count on us to start appropriate therapy. If you pick the wrong drug, you're not really doing anybody any good, yourself, the patient, or the hospital. So that was a lot to take in about pneumonia, but hopefully we picked up some important points there. We're going to talk about um, urinary tract infection, and then we'll wrap up. All right, so urinary tract infection. Again, the most common thing that we see, usually the hardest lab to collect. So make sure that you're on top of it early. Urinary tract infections encompass a spectrum of disease from asymptomatic bacteria and cystitis to pyelonephritis and urosepsis. UTIs are among the most common infections affecting the elderly. Among otherwise healthy geriatric patients living in the community, rates of UTI range from 5 to 30 percent with higher rates seen with advancing age. So as you get older, your risk of infection increases. Among institutionalized patients, the prevalence rates increase even more, between 17 to 55 percent of women and 15 to 31 percent of men. 
So that's almost saying like one in every two female patients in a nursing home has a UTI, as well as one in three of every male patient. These are big, big statistics, big numbers. Anatomic variations during the aging process increase the UTIs. So some examples of that would be changes in prostatic function in men, changes in vaginal flora associated with menopause in women. Elderly patients are more likely to have obstructive uropathy or anatomic changes related to childbirth or reproductive surgery. So all of these things are why they're more prevalent, more common in the elderly population. Other factors that you want to consider, higher rates of incontinence, more frequent urologic instrumentation, higher rates of catheterization, comorbid diseases, and medications that alter bladder function. For some reason, Marlton seems to be the urinary retention catheter problem capital of South Jersey. I've never seen so many people come in with urinary retention and catheter relator problems. Seems like we also have a lot of kidney stones in this South Jersey area. It's just something to consider when you're seeing these patients with urinary retention and in and out chronic Foley catheters. You definitely want to be sending a UA on them. Among young, healthy patients, the vast majority of UTIs are going to be E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, and Staph species. Now, those are the young, healthy patients. Elderly patients actually have a lower incidence of E. coli infection and a higher rate of polymicrobial infection. And again, that'll be important when we pick our treatment. Patients with short-term urinary catheters are typically infected by a single organism, while long-term catheters are associated with polymicrobial infections. The prevalence of gram-positive UTIs in geriatrics patients has been increasing, and that's the enterococcus. Elderly patients often present with atypical symptoms of UTI. One more time, atypical. Malaise, anorexia, weakness, and mental status changes. Delirium and functional decline may be the first signs of bacteremia from a urologic source. Such quote-unquote non-urinary symptoms are more likely to occur in patients with existing comorbidities, including dehydration. And we all know that the patients are dehydrated by the time they get to us because they've been sick for a couple days before they even declare themselves and get sent to the emergency department. Urine microscopy and culture make the ultimate diagnosis. Although we as emergency room residents and physicians, urine cultures aren't really helpful for us in the ER, but they help tailor the antibiotic regimen after initial antibiotic has been started. So it's actually still that age-old adage that if you can only get enough urine for the UA or the culture, that you actually want to do the culture so that we can tailor appropriate therapy. It's also kind of worth it if the patient's been there multiple times, look through their old cultures in the computer and see what organisms that has been in the past so you can choose your appropriate therapy. Talking about treatment, Broad antibiotic coverage for a longer duration should be the cornerstone of any treatment plan. We're not talking about three days worth of treatment for these patients like the young healthy female with cystitis. Really seven to ten days of treatment is preferred for women with symptoms for longer than one week, women with structural or functional changes, and for all men. 14 days of treatment should be routine for elderly patients with pilo. Now again, we're not really going to be choosing the discharge treatment, but just so you have an idea in your head, if these patients come through the ER and they were inappropriately treated with a three-day course or a seven-day course, maybe it wasn't long enough and it's something for you to consider. Treatment of an uncomplicated community-acquired UTI in the elderly is generally with a fluoroquinolone. Now this is interesting because there's a lot of controversy right now over how to treat UTIs from the community because the fluoroquinolones are so prevalent that they're becoming resistant. 
If you talk to the urologists, they're even getting, getting away from Cipro Levaquin, and it's more a macro dentin that's actually a choice right now. Not that you can't do Cipro or Levaquin, but you just want to make sure that if it is somebody that you're sending home, make sh making sure that we have those protocols in place to follow up on those cultures. Due to increased rates of resistance, Bactrim is not preferred as an empiric first-line agent. So you really don't want to be choosing Bactrim for your elderly patients. As a side note, you can give it to elderly women when the sensitivities are confirmed. However, there's a higher incidence of side effects and discontinuation when compared with the fluoroquinolones. A lot of people are sensitive to Bactrim, allergic to sulfa, so just something to keep in mind. Okay, so let's talk about IV antibiotic therapies. A fluoroquinolone, although again, right now, resistant rates are high. And if you talk with the urologists, our, actually our first choice in the ER, we're really getting away from quinolones. Gentamicin, plus or minus ampicillin, that's obviously going to give you great gram-negative and gram-positive coverage. Or a third generation cephalosporin, plus or minus an aminoglycoside. And that's really what I'm doing now, if they're not allergic, is I'm actually, for my admitted patients, is I'm actually choosing Recephin and then waiting for that culture to come back and letting the doctor, the admitting doctors tailor their therapy. It's very unusual for me right now to admit a UTI with Levaquin or Cipro. Things to think about. Selecting the optimum treatment for UTIs acquired in a long-term care facility or in the presence of other complicating factors is more difficult due to the high prevalence of resistant organisms. So a fluoroquinolone should generally be considered, although only cautiously used as monotherapy due to increased rates of resistance in these patient populations. So there it is again, it's automatically our first thought, but we need to think about adding a second drug. In these cases, empiric fluoroquinolone monotherapy may be less preferred than combination therapy. So, what else can you do? Again, aminoglycosides plus or minus ampicillin. Again, that's going to give you your really good gram-negative and gram-positive coverage. An anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam, which is your zosin, or an anti-pseudomonal carbapenem, the imipenem, meropenem. I don't really right for those too often. I'm more of a zosin cefepime person. That's what I trained with, that's what I'm comfortable with. But you can keep that in mind, especially with patients who are truly allergic. Patients who have an increased risk of drug-resistant organism or who are moderately to severely ill should be strongly considered for initial two-drug therapy to ensure effectiveness of the empiric regimen. So again, going back to that slide, this is something that I've been changing also. My admitted patients who are uroseptic or really sick from a urinary tract infection, elevated white blood cell count, elevated lactate, elevated CRP, you really need to start thinking about double covering them from the ER with some choices from this list. In patients with UTIs associated with chronic indwelling catheters, replacement of the catheter is associated with improved clinical outcomes and should be undertaken in the emergency department. Something else that I took away from this lecture, when my patients are coming in from the nursing home already with a Foley catheter in place, I am asking the staff to change their Foley catheter. It's proven that they have better outcomes. So, Maybe it's annoying to do, but it's something that we should be doing for the benefit of our patients. Something to consider. So in summary, we have our little happy geriatric patients now, because we did a good job caring for them. Evaluation and management of the elderly patient with infection in the emergency department presents several challenges to us as emergency physicians. Elderly patients often present without the classic signs and symptoms of infection, requiring vigilance in the face of nonspecific symptoms such as confusion or decreased functional status. These patients are at higher risk of poor outcomes than our younger adults, and they are also at greater risk of infection with resistant organisms, necessitating the empiric use of broad-spectrum antimicrobial agents.
Consideration of these unique aspects of the infected elderly patient will aid the emergency physician in providing optimal care to this at-risk population. And we have some references here. And then if you guys have any questions or comments, it's your floor now. Yes? We see uh, patients coming from assisted living facilities. Not quite community, not quite you know, rehab facility or nursing home. Right. So we be treating them as a community acquired or health care associated? So I think that's, that's a great question that I struggle with on a daily basis. I think that it's really in your history taking. Are they, because some patients from assisted living, they're in assisted living, but they're completely demented and don't really care for themselves. Yeah. So I think it depends on whether it's that walkie talkie patient that's really from the assisted living that's going to bingo and cooking their own meals. I think that they would more so fall into the community category. Whereas the assisted living patient who's demented and in a diaper and mostly bed bound and just has some people coming to check on them would fall more into that healthcare. Interesting though too, like people from assisted living are still dialysis, still might be getting wound care, so you just want to keep that checklist in mind too as you try to categorize them. Great question. living patients would meet health care.
spectrum's coming back to treat skin infections. It always used to be Augmentin or Keflex, and now it's swung the other way. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much.